Welcome to the inaugural season of This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley, the podcast. I'm your host, Sunil Rajaraman, and I'm joined by my co-host, Yasha Kekas-Wolf. Our guest today, Broke Ass Stewart, and yes, you heard that right, Broke Ass Stewart, is a fascinating guy. He actually started off his career as a writer and has written for Lonely Planet, US Airways Magazine, 7x7, The Bold Italic. He was a TV show host for IFC, and you know him better as a protest mayoral candidate. It's actually all that I knew him as, and that's part of the cool relationship into the culture scene in San Francisco, is that you've got people like Brokaw Stewart who in a big city in the U.S. can make a run at a mayor and actually get 10% of the vote here because he stands for a lot of what's interesting about the Bay Area. He does, and this is a a really wide-ranging and engaging interview. Uh, We hope you enjoy this interview with Broke Ass Stewart. Welcome to This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley podcast, Stuart. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you. I've never really thought of myself as being part of Silicon Valley, so this is hilarious. Well, we like to incorporate the North Bay, the East Bay, the peninsula, the South Bay, Mm -hmm. and San Francisco proper as Silicon Valley. The rest of the world thinks that this is the Silicon Valley, so, you know. Do you take issue with that? Um, I mean, maybe. Our listeners can't see your face, but you're looking kind of, like, pensive after I said that. Oh, I just have to poop. Oh, no, I'm kidding. Um, No, I... uh, I don't feel like I don't really work in that sphere. I guess I kind of do work in that sphere. Mm. But I mean, I don't do, I'm not a tech startup. I yeah. don't work in tech. I skewer tech a lot. I mean, I guess I'm in proximity to Silicon Valley, but I live in San Francisco. Yeah. I don't live in Silicon Valley. Uh, where'd you grow up? San Diego. Tell me about that. Uh, you've never been there? I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> like, did you live out by where Gateway was or do you live in downtown San Diego? What's Gateway? You, Gateway, the old computer company with the cow pictures on the outside. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I remember that. Wow. Gateway. It was kind of like the neighborhoods that uh, Poltergeist was shot in. It, that's what it reminded me right. of. Right. I grew up hella suburban. I grew up in a place called University City, and it's uh, east of La Jolla, north of Claremont. Yeah. Um, it's originally built for the professors of UCSD to live there yeah. in the 60s. Super idyllic. San Diego, suburbia. Yeah. With no traffic, maybe 15 minutes from the beach, tops. I, I was I, I liked the beach, all right, but I wasn't like a, you know I had I didn't really like surfers that much. <laughs> uh, I had no problem with people who surf, but it was like surfers, people who built their whole life around that and like their whole like, identity around that. They were just generally dicks, you know. So I uh, kind of didn't get into that whole scene. Yeah. What it when, when you decided to come to San Francisco? Like, what made that happen for you? Was it an accident? Was it purposeful? Did you say I'm in San Diego and I want to leave, and San Francisco's north of Los Angeles, so uh, that's far enough away? I went to college in Santa Cruz, yeah, and so it was the next logical step. I was yeah. like, oh yeah, well, Santa Cruz is great, but it's very small, yeah. But um, I really love Santa Cruz. I never really fully, fully fit in in San Diego. Like I was like you know popular and stuff because like I had this fucking mouth on me <laughs> uh, gets me into and out of trouble. Uh, but you no, know, I was popular and all that stuff. But you know, I was like the one hippie kid in my high school, and I just really didn't fit in uh so you know i went to santa cruz in 1999 it was like perfect i was like, oh shit there's all these hippies i don't even want to be a hippie anymore and so i <laughs> i stopped doing that um yeah and so santa cruz was one of the best decisions i ever made yeah. you know i was surrounded, suddenly surrounded by a lot of people who like were into these other, other ideas that were, i weren't, wasn't really experiencing in san diego that much you know and so then um graduating from there i moved i had a girlfriend here at the time so uh-huh. just went straight to here, and here yeah we are. i've been here for like 15 years did, did, are there things about San Francisco that remind you of San Diego? Are there things that you liked about San, San Diego that you find here? Or is it just a completely new space for you? I mean, there's a lot of cross traffic. And there's a lot of San Diegans here. A lot of people like me who grew up in San Diego who didn't really feel the vibe moved up here. You yeah. Know? And I stay in California, have great weather, have good Mexican food. And uh, you can get home very easily, like on Southwest Airlines for like, you know, 100 bucks. Yeah. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot of San Diego people up here. Interesting. I didn't know that. Like, there's the yeah. San Diego subculture. Do you guys have a bar scene, like a specific place that you go in San Francisco? Uh, San, San Diego, Diego sports fans, well, Chargers fans were, would go to uh, Danny Coyle's, but no, nobody uses a Charger fan anymore because yeah. they love San Diego. You're done now. You can't be a Chargers fan. Fuck them. I don't really care. I'm not. A, I'm like sports agnostic. <laughs> uh, but like, it used, it's different though because now people move here for different reasons. Yeah. When I first moved here, people moved here because they wanted to be in San Francisco because they came here and they found something that lit, lit a fire in them. Right. And said, "This is my place. I belong here." It wasn't. I'm here to work my ass off and leave and not give a shit about the city. Interesting. So you you meet clumps of people like you met me and my friends from San Diego. Then you meet somebody from DC and all their friends from DC and mm-hmm. stuff like that. You know, people move here in groups. That's interesting. I actually hadn't thought about it that way. I really like that. I like I fell through here by accident in the late '90s after I graduated from college, and 
there was kind of like a calling for me. I was like, I want to be here because totally. something's just happening. And there's almost a, like, maybe would you would you describe it as people feel like they have to be here? In what sense? Like, are they indentured? You have to show up in San Francisco because you have to work and you have to work in a specific kind of industry? Is that the... I mean, I think if you're working in tech, there's not a lot of places to go. I mean, and it's different because if you're working in tech, people are coming here, like, with these starry-eyed dreams, like, I'm going to be the next blah, 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 motherfucker, you know? Like, here's my new startup that doesn't do anything that anybody ever fucking needs, but I'll still get $2 million to do it, you know? Like, the amount of things that have been funded that are absurd, that shouldn't even, like... Like, really? You, you, you want a dog walking app that walks you instead of your dog? Here's money. Take it. Take all of it. You know? So, are, are you uh, optimistic about the future of San Francisco? If this is what you feel right now, and I appreciate the hyperbole. If there's like, Actually, maybe it's not even hyperbole, but I appreciate the way you're describing it. Are you optimistic about the future of San Francisco? I am not particularly, no. Um, I think that San Francisco is done as a cultural center. Yeah. Um, I think we've seen it happen in the past, since like 2011 or so. Um really 2012 like here's the thing the grateful dead's never going to come from san francisco again you know new york's done as a cultural center too i mean really in terms of like emerging and underground culture patty smith's never going to come from new york again you know the ramones are never going to do that you know we're never there's, these are not going to be places that create culture that that's groundbreaking yeah we might create apps that help you find that culture in other places but that's just kind of like you know the smalcrum of this shit, you know? So let's go back to that pensive view that you had at the beginning when I said, uh, this is your life on Silicon Valley podcast, and you said, I live in San Francisco. Right. Is the surrounding area to San Francisco possible in your mind as a center for some sort of cultural something interesting? I mean, Oakland is amazing right now, but the yeah. problem with Oakland is it's going to die of the same sickness as San Francisco because Oakland's had the opportunity to look across the bay and see what's happening here yeah. and, and and save themselves by, by instituting more progressive ways to protect the people that are there, but they're not. They're going to suck all the developer dick too. You know, they, they have an opportunity in West Oakland. They could build all, they could build so much dope, multi-use affordable housing, you know, multi-tiered, but they're not going to. Yeah. People have just been sitting on their empty, derelict buildings for decades waiting to, for the buy, big buyout when you, if in a more progressive society, we would be taxing those people pretty heavily for sitting on space and not using it properly, you yeah. know? So, Oakland's, is in a beautiful moment right now. There's so much great stuff happening in Oakland, but it's not going to be able to be, I mean, unless there's an absolute economic fallout, yeah. it's not going to be able to sustain that special place that it is right now. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk about you a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only did you move here, you've become kind of legendary here. And so people know Broke Ass Stewart. First, talk a little bit about how you became Broke Ass Stewart, <laughs> who coined that term, and a little bit about your writing, because you are, you're a writer. Yeah, I'm a writer. Um, so I started off doing Broke Ass Stewart in 2004, I think. Um, I was working in a candy store in North Beach called Z Chocolato. And somebody who, uh, from my neighborhood growing up in San Diego, came in with the woman who's now his wife. As she was walking out the door, she's like, here's my business card. And I said, she's a travel writer. I said, I want to be a travel writer. So I decided to become one. I made my first zine. For those of you listening who uh, don't fuck with analog at all ever anymore, a zine was a blog before there was blogs. You could go to Kinko's and cut, literally physically cut, and paste onto paper and photocopy that and staple it and have your own publication. So a broke ass steward's guide living cheaply in San Francisco came out of my backpack. I <laughs> sold it, you know, from my backpack and then it was in stores. I did all distribution by myself. And that got popular. And then um, the, the short version of it is then I got to end up writing for Lonely Planet. I did Ireland for them and that was cool. And then I, I you know, I, I was looking, I wanted to keep doing broke ass steward. So I found a book deal in 2006, I think. Um, I found it on Craigslist of all places. And the joke I always say is that I was looking for a blowjob and I got a book deal instead, which is only kind of true. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, so Broke Ass has kind of started that way. And then it's become, you know, I, in 2011, I had my own travel TV show on IFC. 2015, I ran for mayor. Uh, you know, I've done a bunch of different things. My career, my life is one big art project, you know? So how, how close did you get to becoming mayor? Not very. Yeah. Yeah, but good. We'd all, I mean, I don't deserve to be mayor. I have no place to be mayor. I wouldn't want to be. <laughs> But I still got like 10% of the vote. That feels pretty close. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure, I mean, for a protest campaign, it's not bad at all. Yeah. I mean, you, you have this massive following. So when you walk around San Francisco, how unusual is it for people to just walk up to you and say, hey, what's up? Happens all the time. All the time? Yeah. Um, my girlfriend, we were not dating for like maybe five months or something like that. I think it took her a little bit getting used to it first. Because she'd be like, there's these girls who are talking to you right now. I thought we we're on a date. <laughs> you know? So what's... You have been pretty vocal about, you know, tech and its role in the city and all of that. What should it be in your mind? So what's the alternative? You have these companies coming up here. You have them moving up here in some sense, gentrifying the, the you know, some of the market area and all of that. What would the ideal 
relationship between tech and San Francisco be in your mind? Well, I mean, it's complicated because it's, it's not an issue of actual technology. My issue isn't technology. My issue is the culture around tech. This very uh, tech bro-centric view of like, what do you mean I can't have what I want? I fuck with the Harvard bro, you know, like, and it's really entitled. I mean, I work in a bar once a week and the amount we had a lot of tech bros and finance bros and I work Friday happy hour. And um, it's amazing the entitlement. And I don't know if it's a generational thing. I'm a lot older than they are. But for example, yes, just, you know, last week or the week before I was sitting there making a drink and somebody, and you know, this happens, all the time, I'm, I'm not even looking at them. They come start barking their order at me. And I was just was not having it that day. And I was like, do I look like I'm not fucking busy? So next time it happens, I'm going to stop and be like, okay, I will do you right now. If you can go to this person I'm helping and tell them that you are more important than they are. Because that's what they're trying to tell you, even if they don't realize it. And that might just be the city. It might just be the generation. I don't know. But there's a lot of that, and not just in the bar. There's a lot of this entitlement of like, well, of course I can move in there. I have money. Who yeah. cares if somebody's grandmother was there before? You know? So there's that. And, and also, it's like, and I've, I've talked to you about this before, there's this, also this feeling of a lot of people who work in tech who don't actually get to be part of San Francisco because they, they take Uber to work and then they work many, many hours. Yeah. They eat all their meals at work. They take an Uber home and they eat dinner at home. Yeah. So like they're not in San Francisco. They're just worker bees. It's a, it's a sad state. We actually had a guest on um, not too long ago, one of the earlier episodes that talked about just that, how San Francisco was like the place that she had a spot that she slept in. It's it's awful. I've got a buddy who like had a successful company and he sold it, and his other friends in tech were like, "So, are you going to stay in San Francisco now that you don't have a company?" And he's like, "What is this fucking startup summer camp?" Like, of course, like he's here because he loves the city, not because like he has a company here. Yeah, you know. But that's like the mentality. It's like, well, if you're, you're not working in tech, why are you here? Right. Which is the exact problem. Yeah. Why are you here if you're not working in tech? That is the problem. Yeah, uh, there's a theme at least. Cindy and I spend a lot of time talking about it. To this idea that. There's a fetish of the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's more Silicon Valley than the Bay Area, but we'll just call it uh, the Bay Area for the sake of this discussion. This kind of fetish of San Francisco shows up all over the place, and there's an emulation of um, that shows up in different places. And maybe it's a, a company that exists here that shows up in some other place that we're excited about or not. Um, let's talk about the idea of San Francisco being fetishized. And in your mind, like, what should people be fetishizing San Francisco for? Well, the things that I fetishize it for, the things that I found that brought me here aren't necessarily the things that are here anymore. So that thing changes, you know? Yeah. For me, it was this, like, very liberal place, which it still is, with all kinds of freaks and weirdos wherever you fit in. Yeah. But, you know, less and less freaks and weirdos are here. I mean, people still fit into a certain extent, but, like, um, it's just not the thing that it was. What are, what are the things that are happening right now that you love? Like, what's happening in the city that you're like, damn it, if that happened everywhere in the world, that would be... The world would be better. Um, I'm really excited about the activism that's happening in San Francisco. We we have a long history of organizing and act and being active and like um, being activists. And there's some of the fucking most amazing organizers here in the not just San Francisco in Oakland too, and in Richmond and in Berkeley and the Bay Area in general. Yeah. And what we're doing in terms of like resisting this fucking bullshit Trump regime is pretty awesome. Uh, that makes me happy. That makes me proud. Yeah, I'd still like to see more people be involved. Yeah, I've got this whole thing of like you know brunch is canceled today, motherfuckers. Like you know. <laughs> We have people not being not let into the country. We have queer rights being uh, threatened. We have all this stuff. Don't go to fucking brunch today. Let's go out and fucking burn some shit down. Not not really burn some shit down, people. But like you know, metaphorically, like let's let's light some shit on fire because we can't just let things happen. You know, and yeah. we can't all protest every day. But when I think about what happened with the women's march, and we had, we had seven continents, even Antarctica, we had, we had millions of people on the streets. Right? If the right had been spending the past forty five years ruining organized labor we could shut down every fucking city in this country every day if we had to the, you know the right's been fighting organized labor since reagan but i mean if we had if you call the general strike 20 years ago 30 years ago and said no until this happens we, nobody works imagine that the impact of that yeah so that's what i thought about with the women's march what if we were able to do that every fucking month then twice a month then three times a month you know it's a little um, ambitious yeah. But like that kind of stuff, like, and that those ideas and that, that kind of organizing happens in the Bay Area a lot. I think it's pretty amazing. So, so we're uh, targeting San Francisco from an audience perspective. People are listening from San Francisco. Where do you tell them to go if they're interested in getting involved? If they want to show up for the Women's March or what the next Women's March is, where do they go? Where do you tell them to go? Uh, you know, definitely subscribe to my email list and my website because yeah. we do a lot of, you know, we, we do everything from dick jokes to, you know, activism. It's important to have both. Side note, like I posted this funny, stupid video of myself uh, the other day, uh, lip syncing to a silly song. And so one person's like, why don't you tell us about more breaking news? And I just put the Emma Goldman quote that's like, I don't want to be part of any revolution where I can't dance. It's like, you got to have fun with it too, you know? But, um, you know, send it for my email list for sure. But also, um, 
the Resistance SF or something like that, which is an awesome Facebook page, awesome email list. You can sign up for their text messages too. Yeah. Uh, Surge, which is um, standing up for racial justice. Mm-hmm. They're really great. I mean, there's there's tons of organizations, you know. Um, and then, of course, like the national ones, you know, obviously like Planned Parenthood, uh, ACLU, Southern Poverty Law Center. Yeah. But, you know, like even if, you know, there's a lot of ways to get involved, whether it's your time or your money. There's, we should all be fighting right now. There's no there's no time for, like, not being political. Yeah. Don't be passive. That's Don't be message. passive at all. We were talking before we started recording about um, just some of the challenges that San Francisco has. And we were, in particular, sharing with you that a lot of our guests have talked about homelessness in San Francisco being an issue and something that they want to be involved in or at least help solve for. You started describing homelessness in a really interesting way. And I wonder if you could kind of replay that for us. Like, sure. What? Well, you know, as I was saying earlier before we were um, on the mic, Homelessness is just the sore on your skin that signifies the sickness this is, that is racking the whole body. So, and the sickness is really, you know, late stage capitalism. And specifically in San Francisco, we're talking um, the rapacious greed of the real estate uh, industry, mm-hmm. the speculation, and then then that catering towards the money in tech. You know, builds this perfect storm of like, you know, I know people who sleep in tents who used to sleep in homes. You know, and they still go to their, their job. These are, you know, like uh, when the homelessness count came out in 2015, 71% of people on the street had San Francisco addresses before they were on the street. 71%. So these are our neighbors who, a bad run of luck and a few bad breaks and a few bad decisions, they're sleeping on, on the street. Yeah. And these are people, you know, you can't have a housing crisis and have a extreme homelessness and not see the correlation between the two. Yeah. And if you don't see that correlation, you're a fucking idiot or a liar. So um, they're tied together. So we have a serious homeless crisis here, and um, it's just indicative of where we are as a society right now, yeah. that we cater towards profits over people every time. So if those are the representations of the sickness that we have, what are the antibodies that you think that we need? Um, you know, what there's, what's been shown to work a lot, I mean, it's really simple. It's like give these people a place to live. It's hard, you know, with the Bay Area when everything's so expensive, but like they call it housing first. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it sounds crazy. Like, why are you going to give people housing? It's going to be so expensive. It's actually so much more expensive to have them on the streets and constantly being in the hospital, have, you know, paramedics come or like police involved than it is to actually just build housing for them. It, there's a statistic, which I don't know what it is, but it's like something like half as expensive. Yeah. Um, it's hard though when you have real estate that's so expensive here, that makes it much more complicated. And, you know, you have the, the super duper pro housing that's just like build, 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 and this market will sort everything out, which I completely disagree with mm-hmm. because you know who the market helps out? The people who help the market out, you know, the people who can help put money into it are the ones who get the money back. So we need to much more progressive and open forms of, of building housing that, that are specifically affordable. Will you be here in 10 years? Um, you know, I don't know. I've got rent control, and that's what the only thing. If I didn't have rent control, I don't know where I'd be. Right now, my entire income is based on writing about San Francisco and, and creating culture here in San Francisco. I'm ultimately trying to expand. Those listening, <laughs> hello. <laughs> my goal is to, uh, you know, expand. Uh, to other cities and be able to do this and be a voice of progressive politics and culture and art um, in, in emerging markets too, uh, emerging cultural markets. Yeah. And I'm, this, I was going to kick it off last week, but, you know, we've had all these travesties, so I haven't done it, but I'm kicking off a Patreon account very soon, Patreon page, so yeah. people can, can help support, bro- you know, because as you probably know, the media business is broken. The actual business of media is broken. How do you continue to fund something when everybody expects everything for free? Yeah. Right. So what I'm asking my followers to do is, you know, if you if this is valuable to you, if this is something that you believe in, please give six dollars a month. Yeah. You know, and right now we get which great. We get like maybe six or seven hundred dollars a month. That's for people getting nothing back for it other than like the shit that they've already been getting for 10 years. Yeah. But with Patreon, I'll be giving little perks. Ten dollars a month gives you this. Twelve dollars a month gives you this. And hopefully, you know, my goal is to get to forty five hundred dollars a month. And once I can do that, I can breathe easy and not like have to scramble every month to pay all my people. And then um, we'll be able to, you know, expand more to Oakland and to other cities we want to be in and really do this same thing where we fight for, you know, my favorite thing about what I do is I get to give people who don't always have access to having a loud voice, I get yeah. to amplify their voice. You, you talk about the arts scene in San Francisco and you caring about it. Like, what is, what's your assessment of the scene of the arts in San Francisco right now? You know, it's cool. I just went to the Arts Band opening um, that was last weekend, I think, and um Arts Bands is a great organization, and they support artists, and and they and so all these artists, and there was 400 pieces of art in this big thing at Soul Arts, and they were all San Francisco artists. And I was yeah. like, yes, there are still people here, there are still people making art, but it's just harder. You know, yeah. like you remember it was like in the 90s or when I was here in like the early 2000s, it was yeah. like there was artists everywhere. There's warehouses, there were squats, there was all this stuff, and that's harder and harder when like the warehouse that used to be an art space is now a uh, you know a tech company. Yeah. 
I know a lot of the arts, uh, the more industrialized art scene, so the ballets and the theater and the and the, and the are all struggling a lot right now because there there's a disconnect between the product that they've been making, which mm -hmm. is supporting these artists, um, and the community that's here now. Uh, but it seems to have showed up over the course of the last several years. Oh yeah, yeah. Since you're not uh, shy with words or calling <laughs> people out or anything like that, are there any particularly bad actors in the world of tech or elsewhere in San Francisco that you want to call out? for not doing a good enough job to support the community or in fact hurt the community? Or are there any good actors that you want to recognize? Well, I mean, it's really complicated because there's things like Airbnb who definitely hurt the community who also help individuals sometimes too. But like, uh, this is this is a true story. A friend of mine um, who got evicted from his place because whatever, the place next door, this, this guy who was older um, and was being evicted. The, the whole building was being evicted because they were turned into an Airbnb hotel. My buddy found this guy trying to hang himself in the backyard because he didn't know where he'd be able to go. And this is because of rapacious greed. Somebody who's like, well, why would I want to invest in a place that have long-term people who love where they live and love their community and are part of the city when I could turn it over to tourists to fucking just get me more money and more money, more money. You know, Airbnb doesn't like me very much. When I was running for mayor, they had this bill they were trying to, they were pushing it like really was tone deaf and detrimental to the society we, we live in here. I think they, they're trying to make things better. On the flip side, they do good things for people who are between things and are do need to make a little extra money. It's great for them as individuals, but I think as, as a community, it's pretty difficult. Yeah. There's always buses fucking Travis, whatever his name, from Uber. Fuck him. <laughs> and that whole, that whole boys club system, you know? I, it's good seeing more and more organizations trying to push women in tech and people in color in tech, you know? And um, I, that's the stuff I'm excited about. It, diversifying everything and I don't mean like diversifying your income I mean diversifying your your company right yeah we, we talk about a lot here we're a not-for-profit the organization that I work for and we talk about the Geppetto problem right? like if you are Geppetto you build what looks like you so you end up with Pinocchio and if you've got a bunch of people that are just like Geppetto you're going to build a bunch of Pinocchios and the world is not a better place when everything is homogenous that there has to be a diverse perspective into anything that you're building mm -hmm. anything that you're working on so um, what's your amen. message to uh Ed Lee Oh, is he still here? <laughs> Whatever. Ed Lee did what he did. He fucked up the city. I mean, uh, I think that uh, he's going to be gone in a couple years, so we'll see what happens then. It'll be really, it'll be really, I mean, he, his, his legacy is going to be opening the floodgates, uh, the Twitter tax breaks that brought all these companies. And at the time, it made a little bit more sense than it does now, obviously, because nobody knew what was going to happen. But, you know, the, you know, the bragging of how many jobs were brought to San Francisco... It, the problem with that is, like, sure, there were so many jobs that are, we're here now, but the, none of those jobs went to people who lost their jobs in 2008, 2009. Yeah. You know, those jobs came, and people came for those jobs. I mean, it's complicated. I, you know, I played uh, SimCity as a kid. It's not easy to run a city. <laughs> <laughs> I have a much more humanistic and, you know, socialistic view of things than um, that, that doesn't work in the market because the market isn't meant to serve people. It's meant to serve profits. So... So we should do the uh, Twitter follows question. Yeah, right? we're. I can't believe how fast the time has gone. <laughs> I, so I talk a lot. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's I mean that a, as a, a compliment. Like, this yeah, is fun. Sure, yeah. uh, we have uh, one question that we always end on, which is uh, if you wanted to give a recommendation out to somebody to follow on a Twitter or an Insta or a whatever, like is there a person or a group or an entity that you'd say everybody that's a listener should be attached to and be oh, following? Oh, God, there's so many. You My, can say so many, too. Let's go for My buddy Dylan Park, he's fascinating to listen to, uh, to follow on Twitter. I don't even know how I met him. Friends from college, I think. He's a black dude who, uh, he served in the military, his dad served in the military, his grandfather served in the military, his great-grandfather served in the military, and like a lot of his uh, ancestors died in the military for this country, and he's a vet who's like anti-war now, and um, he's got these really amazing stories, and he's really anti, you know, but he's, like, he's pro-vet, he's yeah. pro-veteran, he's anti-war, and he's anti, you know, the systematic uh, military-industrial complex. It's really interesting hearing his point of view on all these things that are going on because, you know, people call him out for being, oh, you live tired. He's like, fuck you. I went to Afghanistan and Iraq and I fucking shot people. What? What have you done? You know? Dylan Park. Yeah, he's fucking, and he's, his stories are fucking whoa. So he's great. I mean, there, and then there's lots of great local people. Uh, fucking Nato Green's always great to follow. Joe Fitz. Me, Joe, and um, Nato are like the uh, socialist contingent on the SF Examiner. <laughs> it's pretty funny because um, the Examiner used to be a conservative rag. And now it's like not. Now they have the us three who are like way, you know, way left. It's pretty funny the comments I get at least. Um, God, there's so many people. Who else do I follow? Um, I don't know. Twitter makes me so angry. It's like, you know what it's like? It's like, you guys remember Ghostbusters 2? Remember that pink sludge? It took everybody's anger and it bubbled up and oh, made everything yeah. worse? That's Twitter. 
like everything bad, everybody just focused their evilness into Twitter. Yeah. And then like, so that's why I follow some like cute puppy accounts too. As you should. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for the time today. Yeah, this is yeah. awesome. awesome. Thanks, awesome for, thanks for being here. Thank you. And um, to all those listening, you can find me on all platforms, Broke Ass Stewart. Um, it's pretty hard to forget. <laughs> But yeah, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and sign up for my email uh, blast because it's awesome. Do that. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley, the podcast. We are always looking for great topic suggestions and suggestions for future guests. Email us at info at thebolditalic.com if you have suggestions on either. Thanks for spending some of your time today with us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of season one.